Yeah, so I created like a many things, like the biggest one was like History Jess, like maybe five years ago. That's incredibly popular on GitHub. Then I dog pad, consumed like the last, how long now? Like four years of my life, um, I guess. Um, this isn't, can I actually hook up the laptop and I'll show you some things? Yeah, absolutely. Here's the new bit, right? In 2014, I burned out from 10 years of professional programming and of life in general. After a while, I embraced money as living and became a volunteer at a donation-based vegan soup kitchen in Sydney. It was actually like perhaps the most rewarding work in my life, surprisingly. I actually got a smile, laugh, and interact with people solving a real need with joyous food and great company without discrimination, even financial. So, a big issue that maybe like a lot of people don't know about, especially like with top open source people, um, is that it's actually quite flipping hard. <laughs> um, so this is something that I wrote this in like May last year um, around Camp JS, which was around then. Um, Damon, um, Rod, Thomas, a few other people I invited into like this conversation to try and figure out like you know what the hell do you do. And at that time, it was very flippant bleak, right? So I was like, you know, what are the options for actually wanting to participate in the free culture and the open source movement when you are actually really good at it? And by really good, I mean like you're in the top like 100 open source developers in the world, right? Now, the solutions I came up with was like, support the system you disbelieve in, live moneyless or suicide, <laughs> right? And at the beginning, I'm like, okay, this is um, this is pretty bleak, and I held on to it. And I was like, I'm hoping I'm going to find like a more positive thing before I actually like release this. And at the time, I did it. And like, I'm happy to report now, like I'm finding some more positive things. So this isn't just a depressing talk. <laughs> so this is actually going to hopefully get a bit positive. Um, actually, no, it will get a bit positive. All right. So anyway, just for like a bit of the the bit about this is there's going to be a screenshot that Thomas um, Thomas Davis just over there he created CDNJS with a few other people Jason resume he's quite big in the open source scene as well um, da -da -da. now the suicide thing is pretty touchy and I just want to touch on this because it's actually a big issue in this industry um, like for instance, like just the ones I'm aware of, like Aaron Swartz, Ila Dintoski, um, he created, um, yeah, this, yeah, Diaspora, um, which is like a meant to be a distributed Facebook. Um, Why the Lucky Stiff, um, big influencer in the Ruby community, he wrote like, a, what was it? What was his great wise poignant guide to Ruby, um, and that was like he was quite influential and he committed like a digital suicide so he erased everything from his online persona. Um, there's like, I'm not gonna go in, well the voluntary human extinction movement is just, yeah, I'm not gonna, you can read up about that if you want, right? But there's there's a big issue, right? And like this is probably one of the, the ones that pisses me off, right? Which is I am aware of how programming is often coupled with depression and how entrepreneurship is often coupled with anxiety. I'm also aware of articles that imply these mood disorders are necessary in order to be good at these professions. Now, I'm not sure if it's just like me, but how often has like someone, by a raise of hands, you don't have to raise your hand if you don't want to, but has anyone experienced that before where they thought that anxiety was actually beneficial to the work? All right, so we've got one other person, right? Um, there's another one. So anyway, this like big kind of consume me a bit and I thought a lot about this and just like I I'm can't find the um the link particularly to the screenshot that I want but let's say for instance like on github notifications like the average thing I guess for no let's have some shouts how many notifications do you usually get on github in like a day right like at, at the time is it like between like zero and a hundred for like a week right Thomas currently has four and a half thousand unread GitHub notifications, <laughs> right? For myself, it's like in the thousand, right? <laughs> it's like, and it's a thread that we've created. Like, so Isaac um, Schluter, he created a GitHub repo, actually called GitHub, where people can like talk about the issues that they have with GitHub. And one of the ones I created is like, GitHub actually needs to do more to support the people who actually use its software the most. Right, like without these top open source developers, like 
it is like that's the people who are making GitHub it. It's that like GitHub doesn't like support us at all. So it's like, you know, you log in and then suddenly it's like, hey, there's sorry, my phone is like going crazy. Um, and suddenly there's like a thousand notifications you have to deal with. Like that's not good. <laughs> like it's just like a huge hit of serotonin. Um, so it turns out like this actually isn't a um a unique thing. This is actually quite a big issue in this industry. And we can think about this in terms of, okay, let's look at programming in general. You're sitting in front of a computer for like eight hours a day in, in, in a silo, often maybe at home if you're freelancing. It's pretty lonely. So I looked into this and we actually, there's several of us collaborating on this website called burnout.io. Um, there's now people talking about this. If burnout is an issue, you know someone who is you know, suffering from that, this is a very good resource. Um, it gives you like actionable advice. Um, there's resources about this you can help out as well. Um, so for instance, like here's some quotes from different people. Greg is a big um, speaker about this. He was featured in the latest note up. Yeah, so no, just for another scale, right? The, it was maybe five note ups ago. Um, they actually had one all about mental health with developers and how it's actually a big thing. Um, and it was actually really good that this conversation has started. I think like five years ago, the creator of JS Conf US, he had, he went through a depression as well and he actually talked about it for like the first time at like a big conference. And then since then, each year, they've always had one talk about mental health or just about health in general. It's always been really good. So there's like a few things in here. I think like I've got two quotes um, featured. Right, so yeah, there's help open source maintainers stay sane. And this is the, um, the GitHub issue one that is actually gonna be quite good. So this is like all the issues. Oh, that screenshot's down. That's the screenshot I wanted, right? But then we have like, a lot of big people actually in the industry like talking about you know what could GitHub do, so it's interesting. Um, Dominic Tarr is like someone who I've also collaborated a lot onto this. Now at the end of this surviving free culture thing, this is like May last year. Um, you know I didn't really have any positive <laughs> outcomes on this. I had a lot of ideas about what to do. Um, now if we go back to like my GitHub thing, you can probably see right. So it's like around like maybe March, which you can't see anymore. Like that's when the burnout happened. Then it was like some consulting work and like another thing. Here's like, I don't know what I was doing then. Oh, that was like maybe some university stuff and helping out and then now it's like, hey, but it's funny, right? Because here, before GitHub used to say, under a rock in a hard place, right? In terms of as if, if you weren't committing every day, then you're kind of sucking. Right, and there's been like a lot of developers who I know who maintain a GitHub streak for publicity. And they, like, it stresses them out that they want to maintain the streak. And I don't think that's something rewarding. And it's good to see like GitHub has actually changed that. Because so it's no longer. Because a script could do that anyway. Huh? Like a script could do that anyway. Yeah, I know, right? And I think it was sad at that point with the hard rocks. So I'm glad that's changed. Because before my criticism was like, just because you're not having GitHub activity, doesn't actually mean that you know it's a bad thing. And just like maybe to explain this, right? There's like many scripts to actually maintain like you know your rankings online. So there's like so third most is it this one? So yeah, here's like one of these scripts. Um, and some people like opt out of this. Like generally, I think I probably keep it in for work. But you know when you go through the burnout, then it's like these stats are continuously getting worse, and it doesn't really help you. Um, so yeah, what did I do? Like I volunteered in like a soup kitchen, actually like socialized with people. That was really cool because I like worked 10 years like at home alone. So that was good. Um, I did some things. But recently I did like a journey, which is actually why I'm here. And I'll just show you like that journey. When we buzz along on the internet a bit more, right? So we'll say, okay, Brisbane which is where we are, right? Um, Brisbane. Is this actually interesting? Yeah. <laughs> Good. Um, and we'll say Perth, right? So, I yeah, I was from, I spent the last five years in Sydney. I'm actually from Perth, that's my hometown. 
I moved back there like when I burnt out, I guess. Um, now, in that surviving free culture thing, um, I also talked about just with sustainability, it's something that really interests me. Like when we go to a conference, ah, oh, you, okay. I'm gonna have to drag this because it still recommends going that route, right? Did that drag? Come on, come on. Why? All right. I'm just, I'm going to cheat and I'll add like the name of the actual highway. <laughs> there we go. So, um, and I'll do the earth one because it's a little bit more epic, right? So in the Surviving Free Culture one, I was like, hey, you know, sustainability is important and adventure is really cool. So how about, you know, instead of getting a flight to drive into a conference, why don't we hitchhike? That's always fun. And, and I thought about this, and I was actually gonna do it for the last Camp JS that I attended, but I actually got incredibly sick, and then they bought me a ticket, like a company sponsored a ticket, Prismatic, um, because otherwise I would have just been too sick to actually attend. But this time, you know, I was in good health. So over the past like 10 day, or well, actually Wednesday, like two weeks ago, it took me 10 days, and I actually hitchhiked that entire journey. Um, 5,500 um, kilometers. And that's pretty incredible. Um, now, this, this was interesting for a few reasons. One, because like I, as programmers, we can also be very cynical, like it's our job to find problems and things, and it's also our job to kind of hate users a bit. Um, or at least, you know, think that, I'm not gonna go into that some more, I'll just dig myself a bigger hole. Um, so the idea was this was that this would like turn me into like a Zen master of patience, like sitting beside the road. Um, this would also inspire huge faith in humanity because to travel like 5,500 Ks, depending solely on other people's generosity, is pretty epic. So luckily, like yes, it has improved like my faith in humanity um, a bit. There's also been like some downsides, um, which I will get into. Right, but I'll just share some photos because photos are always awesome, aren't they? So first ride um, was with this guy. So um, my first day, I had my friend Gary, he's the one in the middle. He's hitchhiked around Europe as well as um, some of Australia. Um, so he had told me the first day, so I was a bit less nervous, right? And then he went back on the first day back to Perth. This guy, we got this ride in two minutes. Is that beginner's luck or what, right? So it's like inspired me to like kind of keep going with that. Um, then we got a ride with actually an Aboriginal fellow, and then we got a ride with this fellow. Um, he was delivering hay. This is like maybe two hours now out of Perth. We were stuck here for two hours. That's my food supplies. Got to have my kale. <laughs> um, and yeah, we were stuck there for two hours. We have like some funny videos. Then we got picked up by like a Catholic priest. Um, he drove us maybe like an hour down, and then. My friend went home, Gary, and I was stuck here for three hours and it started getting to nighttime and it started getting quite cold. All right, I'm gonna have to change this view. Um, but luckily, I got a road, love ride in a road train, which is really awesome. Um, so with the road trains, you always have to talk to them at the actual petrol stations because generally the, they, they need to trust you, right? Um, then, and they're never going to stop because they have the schedules and it's a pain in the ass to stop a very heavy vehicle. So he drove me um, to a place called Southern Cross. That's what it looked like inside. There was like a bed in the back, which was like a love shack. And like, this was an amazing truck. It was fantastic. Um, and then he hooked up a ride with another fellow called Simon um, immediately as we stopped. And when I set up my tent on that night, this was what was outside my tent. <laughs> <laughs> and this um, was very scary considering they were both bulls um, and I had a red basket. <laughs> so, so this is at like midnight, like 12.30 at night. So I, um, I was very concerned, but they went face. They were just like, why are you shining this light on my face? It's a bit rude. So they circled around my tent a few times and then they left. Um, <laughs> And we saw the sunrise, so we woke up at like 5.30, um, hopped in the truck, 
um, some mining pits, and that was Simon. So he drove me about a thousand k's. Got dropped at Leona, um, a petrol station WA. Um, actually, I'll show you like on the map. So like, first day, um, got dropped about here, um, which is quite good distance. Um, Leona is, yeah, about there. So going back to the photos, um, this was like my food setup. So like cooked some beans and some like kale and veggies as well as like a curry packet. Um, and then, then it was, a, what a lot of people don't know is like you usually take the Nullarbor and then if you go to Uluru, it's always like by Alice. So they just go flight to Uluru. They're kind of cheap. Um, this stretch here is a 1000 kilometer dirt road and it has no reception. Um, so I got a ride with another fellow, a Kiwi fellow who was a mechanic um, to about here, which is a place called Jukies. Now, what's interesting about this is that um, you will see down the road, I'll get like a pictures of like the road, um, so you actually understand what this road is like. But you're gonna see some selfies every now and then, so. This is a road, so a thousand kilometer gravel road. Now, in the bush, every now and then, you actually see like a burnt car, because what happens is that the, um, it's too expensive to get a mechanic out there. It's in the thousands of dollars. If your car is cheap, then you just drive it, it runs out of petrol, something goes wrong, you just put it in the bush and set it on fire because like you're screwed. Well, <laughs> so, you set it on fire, but is that just for fun? Yeah, that's just for fun, <laughs> right? Um, so yeah, it's just an uh, interesting thing. So Simon was a mechanic and he was actually hired out there for like a f many of, you know, in the tens of thousands of dollars um, to fix these, these trucks, right? Sorry, not Simon, this guy, Richard. Um, so he dropped me at this Jukies Roadhouse, and here you can, you can see some of the cars, right? Um, so that was actually where I camped. Um, I dug myself like a hole for a fire, set my stuff up. Um, that's like the night time. Um, that was like, you know, the morning vista, I guess. Um, so this is like, now I got dropped out at like 1 p.m. on Thursday. So like I made this amazing time, like 14,000 Ks in like pretty much 30 hours, right? And then now here, the, the you don't use unleaded petrol um, in the Aboriginal communities, you use Opal because petrol sniffing is a big issue. Petrol is $2.20 a litre, um, which is incredible. And now I ended up spending um, 45 hours there, three days. Okay, $2.10 a litre. Um, and that was interesting because there was too many flies to actually read. so. And there was no reception and only like so I became a Zen master in those days all right so I learned a lot of patience um, because yeah there's like actually I have a video that explains it like a lot better which is quite funny this is probably ah I don't have the audio wait maybe I can like cheat Oh, it's not gonna work. All right, anyway, I'll just show you the um, beginning bit, right? So this is me lying on the road. You can see all the faces in my thing, right? Why am I lying on a road? Because there's only a car once an hour. <laughs> and there's no cars after 2 p.m. So when you're a hitchhiker, it's, <laughs> it's, it's a bit funny, right? Um, and then that's just like me smiling like on the middle of the road because you know I've become a Zen master at that stage. Um, that's like the actual road and Jukies is like in the middle. Um, now, when I was setting up my tent that night, um, it was actually quite interesting because it started raining. Um, so what I did was I stopped setting up my tent because it started raining and instead I went and pulled bonnets off several of the cars in the car junkyard, put it on top, barricaded this SUV, tore out the bottom, sawed off the seat belts and set up my bed in there just in case it rained too heavily. But luckily it stopped raining and I didn't have to use that as my option. So I was very in, in, <laughs> impressed with my industrialists. Um, then I got a ride with the Aboriginal family uh, along the dirt road. Um, that was three hours and not one word in the middle of the bush, which was amazing. <laughs> um, and there was like two dogs climbing on top. Then I got a ride with um, Bryony. She put me up in a room, which was fantastic. Um, that was in Warakuna. And then I left Warakuna on my way outside of WA finally. Um, so on the way to Alice Springs. 
I got picked up by a fellow called Brody, um, saw the augers, um, which is like those rocks like behind me. And that was really nice. Um, and then I got saw Uluru um, with Brody as well. So there we go, there's Uluru. Um, and yeah, it was really nice. This is gonna be like a whole lot of photos of Uluru because <laughs> it takes like three to five hours to actually walk around it. Um, yeah, so then I got a ride to Outer Springs. Then I got picked up by a fellow called Nick outside Outer Springs. And Nick was hilarious. He, um, he was another community manager. His job was to um, hang out with, well, his job was to actually take the Aboriginal elders out on helicopters to get approval for which land they can burn. Like, if you can't imagine a more awesome job than that, like five days of riding in a helicopter like, over the Northern Territory, like, that's a pretty awesome job. So he was very psyched about it as well. Um, now, by this time, I was like very enthused by my trip. How many days in we did you get to the north? Um, so I spent, it would have been maybe five, like halfway. Yeah. So, and that's like with that three day delay. So like, it really depends. So this is like now past, see, the outback. Um, now, okay, what's this? Ah, oh, that's just some, um, ah, yeah. So I ended up getting dropped in like a place um, called, what was it, Barrow Creek. And like, I set up my tent on some grass that it turned out that I was allergic to. <laughs> um, oh yeah. So yeah, that's Brody. Um, he was really cool. He put up me up in a room as well. Um, and yeah, this was like the pub um, that I got dropped at by Nick, which is the one I was telling you about who flies in the helicopters. So that was really cool. And it's interesting because the Aboriginals get to pick their names. So they have names like Tommy Thompson and um, Ned Kelly and um, Joe Bird and stuff, right? And like Tommy Thompson, he was like still on walkabout when he was discovered at like 13, right? So it's pretty epic. Um, but these days, like no one actually lives traditionally anymore. Um, then I got picked up by these, um, I guess, hillbillies. <laughs> um, and then I got a ride with these fellows and these fellows were amazing. Now, so like a car of Aboriginals pulled up and you know, I asked them like, you know, smoking, drinking, what not. Um, which isn't a bad thing. I'm not <laughs> casting judgment on that. And you know, I said, hey, you know, can you give me a ride up? And they got the family to come. Um, like another car was coming up, and it was these fellows. Like one of them hopped in the other car to make the way. They started drinking in the bush as they do, um, and it was an epic experience. And on the ride, so it's Chrissy on the left, Bambino, Gracie, and Belicia. Um, so it, it's great and. I'm driving in the front seat, Bambino is in the back, and the car is amazing. So like, the the car has like no side um, mirrors, the, the windscreen's cracked, the boot doesn't close, you have to tie it with a um, string. And um, I'm driving and Bambino's saying, yeah man, like my English is really good, like I learned how to read in prison. And I'm thinking, ah oh, cool, w was that a good experience? And he's like, yeah, you know, I got to learn how to read in prison, like not in school, but in prison. And I'm thinking, okay, so would you recommend um, prison or school then? And he's like, not prison, not prison. <laughs> and then we get to, um, to Tennant Creek, which is like the main stop before you head off to um, Queensland. And um, he sees like a, 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 what he thinks is a cop car. So he spins the car into the bush and the car's still driving. And then he runs out and the car's still going along. And he's like, I'm not going back to prison. And like, that's the last I see of him as he runs from the bush. <laughs> so then they put on the handbrake while the car's still moving. I get myself out the thing and continue my walk on. <laughs> but it's like, like, I can, it's, it's amazing, right? Because you hear so many like horror stories and it's like, it's the nicest people, right? So it's, you know, it's still so good. Um, that's what the scenery starts look like. In. Um, now, if you get to to be a hitchhiker, it's interesting. We actually leave trails to each other. So here will be like, okay, this is my name, I guess. This is the date that I was here, and how many past vehicles there was, right? So I arrived at I think 4:30. I actually stayed overnight. I camped in the bush, um, and then the next day, maybe like 10 or 12 vehicles passed. So you can start getting some more inspiration about how many 
how long you have to wait. Now that's um, maybe some more selfies. Selfies are good. That's me contemplating like the way back. Then I got a ride with Sam from Taiwan and we picked up another hitchhiker. Um, so he picked up me hitching and then we picked up this other guy and he's 60 year old and he's been hitchhiking around the world for 40 years. So that was crazy, and but Sam forgot to check he had enough petrol, and we had 200 k's left. So we luckily managed to make it with like a liter or so left in the car. Um, but then we kicked the other guy out because he was a bit annoying. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I ended up getting um, dropped just after Klong Curry, um, which was quite a beautiful area. It's astounding, um, and. That was a terrible decision where I actually set up camp because that's where I set up camp, it seems all fine, but that's how close I was with the road and all the road trains came through all night long. So that was a very bad decision about camping that close to the actual bush. Then I got a ride and did we did 14,000 Ks in about um, 12 hours, I guess. So epic distance, listening to pretty much pop electronic the entire time and then some country. Um, so that was with this fellow here. And then I had my last um, drive with Cattle Farmer Row and he dropped me at Brisbane. So like the thing, and that was like my gear, right? So Briz, like the big backpack and the small thing. So very epic, very glad I did that. Um, now, would I recommend this for everyone? Actually, yes, I would. <laughs> um, but like, yeah, I really don't have enough good things to say about that experience. And the thing that saddened me the most about it was how many empty seats drove me by because people were too scared of picking me up. And when I considered that experience, it's just like, what I found astounding was, if I'm in the middle of the outback, like I've already made it like 3,000 Ks. I'm pretty sure I'm a trustworthy person, uh, right? Like if you've already gotten that far, you're probably going to be okay. Now, yes, there's like horror stories, but they are few. You don't hear about the great good stories that are happening all the time. Um, now, that's given me like a lot more hope, I guess, like about humanity, about the future, about just sustainability um, in general, because that whole thing cost me a hundred bucks to make that distance. And it was like an adventure of a lifetime. And, you know, I met amazing people along the way and with zero emissions. Um, as well, like the food cost was the only emissions I actually did because everyone was driving that way anyway. So that's pretty incredible. Um, now, what am I going to do? Like, how, in relation to programming, like, you know, how is this perhaps going to be useful? It's more like just like since last year, like, I've pretty much survived on like no money at all, which is surprising. Like, I did volunteering at the soup kitchen. I worked like two days a week and I got all my food for the week and it was like amazing in Indian curry. So that was a place called Mental as Anything. Um, my partner in Sydney, she did pet sitting. So we got free accommodation and we actually got paid to look after people's pets. For the New Year's Eve, we were in a seven bedroom mansion and we held a huge party at our place. And like, so we actually had free accommodation, we had free food and our only expense was pretty much like you know, pretty much nothing. Like I, I live for dirt cheap. Um, so the moneyless option here actually has turned out to be like fairly good. And I'm glad that the suicide thing I've actually ruled out. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, it, the thing is, is that um, we don't like, this is coming from like someone who, um, you know, worked up that rat race in Sydney and kind of like got a bit crazy, like the amount of, you know, dough you can actually earn there is a bit incredible but it's just like you know you also need meaning and I like it for a lot of people like the money is the meaning um, but like as I say on like my website it's like you know I'm a like privileged white male from like a middle-class family like I can pretty much do whatever the hell I want and like still be fine um, I understand that privilege is because of my exploitation of other people or, like my ancestors exploitation so it's like you know, I could still be programming, I could still probably be doing dog pad, but at the same time, it's like I can utilize this privilege um, because other people are very skilled programmers and that's only gonna increase. So maybe like I'll teach programming, maybe I'll do this, but right now this is something that's incredibly interesting and it's so much fun. Um, and yeah, so my plan now is to 
Um, is the map still open somewhere? So my plan now is to actually hitch the entire coastline on the north coast, head the way back to Perth, arrive in Perth by September, and then walk 1,000 kilometers to Albany, and I'm doing a bushwalk that takes two months. Then after that, I decide what I want to do. Um, whether it's returning to programming or whether it's like, you know, continuing being like a, a bum. <laughs> so, so yeah, um, but yeah, I think it's still meaningful work. And I think a lot of the times it's like, you know, we kind of get fixated in this, this idea that, you know, this is something that I have to do. This is where my skill is. And, you know, doing something crazy out of the ordinary is very scary and we may not want to do it. But at least like, you know, perhaps for me, maybe it's because of my privilege, maybe it's just because, you know, it's maybe it's applicable for everyone, but at least this is like a crazy possibility that maybe people haven't considered. So I hope that's actually like a useful talk. It's not related to program at all, but it's about, I guess, a programmer, so.